On this episode of China Unscripted, the China Commission is holding Wall Street accountable for subsidizing China's Marxist-Leninist regime. Could the solution for China be a Confucian-style democracy? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Chong. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Joining us today is Piero Tozzi. He's a lawyer and the staff director of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. Before that, he was the Republican staff director for the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. Thank you for joining us today. That's a pleasure to be here with you. You know, I really like that I have to use that hand sign to pronounce your last name, Tozzi. I want let's have a pizza for lunch. Is that okay? <laughs> I like that you're starting this out on a very professional note. Welcome Absolutely. to our podcast for the yes, first thank time. You, thank you. Now I've I've, I've heard worse. So, uh, but uh, yes, Tozzi in the old country, with a little uh, the hand gesture there. You've heard worse. That implies that you've heard better too. Uh, well, that's, uh, yeah. I started it off like that because I know the kids they like the pizza, <laughs> so this is making it relatable. There we go. The kids like the pizza. The kids like the pizza. I've heard this. Them and their Ninja Turtles. Uh, Piero, have you been to Taiwan? I've been to Taiwan, yeah. yeah. Have you ever yeah. tried their Vova pizza? No, you know, I. it's, 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 it's funny. Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, I, I know the pizza has evolved there from when I first went there in 1988, as have a lot of things. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's just uh, actually up in Rockville over the weekend, and there's a great Taiwanese restaurant there. So if you like Oajian and Oamiswa and uh, delicacies like that, uh, the Taipei Cafe is your place. So The only Taiwanese food I like is boba pizza. <laughs> that is full stop. Hey, so APEC just happened. Uh, finally, Biden and Xi Jinping met. Uh, was was this a great victory for America? Was this the adults in charge and diplomacy back on the table? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think probably the uh, kind of a, a uh, in a moment of uh, clarity, uh, President Biden uh, called Xi Jinping a, a dictator, and uh, amid all the uh, uh, the sort of the disassembling and and the um, uh, we're back to business as, as usual and all the misperceptions. Uh, I think that was a moment of clarity. I know it made, uh, seems to have made, uh, secretary, uh, Blinken wince a, a bit, but, uh, I think we have to keep in mind the nature of the, of the regime. They are, uh, it's a communist regime. It always has been. And if you go back to the whole, uh, uh, engagement theory and the, um, uh, a lot of, uh, wistful thinking about the golden age of reform era China. I, I think it always overlooked the uh, the fact that you're dealing with a, a Marxist Leninist Maoist regime. And one thing I think we can be grateful to Xi Jinping about is that the mask is off. So, um, uh, but I think APEC. Uh, I, I think what was very disturbing was the two standing ovation, ovations that he got when you had business le leaders gathered there. Um, that I think, um, you know, at, at, at the China Commission and in Congress, there are limits to what we can do uh, to impact uh, China's uh, development there. That's something for the Chinese people. But one thing that we can do is um, just address U.S. companies that subsidize tyranny. And that, I think, is something that uh, uh, that's been a focus of ours. And I think it 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 uh, it. Uh, will continue in the future. But. Yeah, I, I, that uh, that that standing ovation made me cringe so oh, much. Oh, that like, that uh, Tim dinner. Cook was there. Yeah, uh, a lot of big pharma people were there too. It's like you know, hey, China, China's great. They can just have prison camps full of people that we can harvest organs from. That's great for American pharmaceutical companies. I Come mean, on. I mean, it is I, though. I actually don't know that that has a lot to do with American pharmaceutical companies, particularly. Well, it just seems like it would be distasteful to be No, no. I mean, I, I agree that you shouldn't be giving that a standing ovation. It should have been I, a sitting ovation. I don't want to imply that we're saying that like they're using harvested organs for American pharmaceutical companies. All right. We're covering ourselves <laughs> legally. I'm just saying if you are in the business of pharma and you're supposed to be making people healthier. No, no. I agree. I mean, like we want to talk about that the transplants that Society is yeah, like really terrible. But back to 
the APEC thing. So now to me, the thing that I'm concerned about is, you know, after Nancy Pelosi's 2022 trip to Taiwan, mm-hmm. China cut off um, narcotics talks. They cut off military to military communication. And su- supposedly from APEC, uh, those things are back on the table. Now, to me, that doesn't seem like a victory. To me, that seems like, oh, Beijing has a carrot they can dangle in front of us. Right, now. Right. Anytime the U.S. does something they don't like, we'll just pull those military talks or the narcotics communications. Well, it, you know, ironically, I mean, I think actions speak louder than words. Uh, at, at the same time, you look at uh, uh, China's actions in the South China Sea, whether it's swarming with Philippine naval ves- vessels, buzzing U.S. and Canadian aircraft, or now this most recent incident involving uh, an Australian diner, diver and the, uh, um, you know, the the uh, this is the use of sonar to um, uh, to harm him. So I think um, it, it, and this is happening while while APEC is is going on. So it, you know, if you want to talk about military to military uh, um, uh, contacts, um, well, there, there there is close contact happening simultaneously, and I think the focus should be on that. You know, with regard to uh, fentanyl, uh, back in 2018, when I was the uh, um, staff director for the Africa Subcommittee, and Chris Smith of New Jersey was the uh, the chairman. Uh, we did a hearing on China and fentanyl. What what I think is is telling is that China had a, a an amphetamine methamphetamine crisis uh, too that was affecting their youth. They shut down these labs uh, overnight. That's something that they could have done a long time ago with uh, with fentanyl. Um, but you know, there's this I think asymmetric. Uh, uh, welfare strategy, and I think that that the the legacy of the opium wars, this is sort of the opium wars in, in reverse, is what uh, is why that uh, China hasn't taken action on fentanyl. So you know this talk about uh, an agreement that was reached and and uh, you know uh, milestones. Uh, I, I'm very very skeptical, and and I, I think um, one can really question their their good intentions but again we'll see what develops but uh you know because actions do speak louder than words well this is well this is why i think it's so important that you you start out by mentioning that you know china is a marxist leninist regime because that's the ideology driving this kind of unrestricted warfare and you know despite biden twice now calling xi jinping a dictator overall i feel like the administration particularly secretary of state blinken has not really hammered on that note they seem to i do think it was interesting that biden this time didn't just because the question was whether he still considered xi jinping a dictator and he was said yes and then he said something about like he's from a communist yeah country so like you know <laughs> they like, like yes so it's not like they don't understand that china is communist but it's almost like they want to just shove it to the side a little bit yeah do you have any insight on that take yeah it, it's it's interesting and i think there's um our, our policy towards china has been um somewhat schizophrenic and there probably is a, a difference of opinion uh in the administration it, it, if you look at where we were during the obama years where you know it was all uh, engagement and then you know trump i think and democrats will will that are involved in this space i think will agree move the overton window really changed uh, perceptions towards uh uh towards china seeing it just not just as a uh a um strategic rival but a systemic one as well the biden policy has kept a lot of that in place so we're, we're certainly in a better place than we were uh back in in uh, pre-2016 um and it, what's interesting is that you've seen some people leave the administration like wendy sherman uh, in, in part because of, of disagreements over China policy. Uh, so those are, are positives. Um, but I think the concern with, with, with APEC and to what extent is, is you know, this new policy driven by sort of short-term political calculation uh, as opposed to a re-emergence of the re-engagement theory, uh, I, I guess time will, time will tell. But, um, you know, you have... Uh, uh, insofar as you have people like Kurt Campbell and and others that are uh, influencing uh, um, China policy, I mean, I, I think there's uh, there still is a mixture of of, of realism. 
Um, but I, I think what, what I suspect is that uh, there's a lot of short-term termism that's driving uh, the policy now, uh, looking for quick fixes to improve the U.S. economy uh, in advance of, 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 of elections. But, uh, but uh, you know, so uh, I think overall, though, if you look at the trend line since, you know, over the past decade, which coincides with Xi Jinping's um, uh, uh, chairmanship uh, or as general party secretary, um, I think that we are in a more realistic place vis-a-vis China and, and its intentions. Um, but it, in some ways, this, uh, um, you know, APEC was a step back. And I think, I think the big concern here is uh, U.S. businesses. Because and if Xi Jinping were to be, um, you know, um, disappear from the scene and a new leader were, were to emerge and the relations uh, on the surface got better, the rhetoric changed uh, and and whatnot, you would see a lot of businesses uh, probably saying that, oh, great, you know, our our engagement is 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 back. Um, but that doesn't change the nature of the regime, China's long term objectives here, and again, we have to drive home the point that U.S. businesses should not be subsidizing tyranny. And we can talk about some tools for, for doing that if you want, but um, yeah. Do you feel that Wall Street is influencing, because um, I know we've talked before on the show about Wall Street's influence over presidential administrations and n- not just during Obama or Biden, but also the Trump administration. There are business people who come in and try to like do the engagement thing. Like I remember with Trump, Steve Wynn, um, who owns all those casinos, was trying to like pass, you know, communications to Trump from the Chinese side and like try to get him to not be so hard on China for uh, a bunch of different issues. And uh, do you think that the Wall Street has a similar uh, effect on Congress since you're part of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. Like, is that a concern? That, that, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, and I think with the Trump administration, the position of Secretary Mnuchin was also uh, different. So every administration is going to have countervailing voices. I think um, overall, if you talk the U.S. House of Representatives, I think the the China realists are are much stronger, including within the Democratic Party. And, and you know, give credit where credit is due. A lot of that, uh, Nancy Pelosi's legacy um, there too. She's hasn't been, uh, you know, she sometimes shifted according to political winds, but by and large, she's been very uh, strong on China and has had a realistic uh, appraisal of that. I think probably in the Senate, and part of it's the way the Senate is structured, um, you probably will see a greater... Um, uh, ability of Wall Street to to influence things, and that probably is with with both parties as as, as well. But by and large, I think in Congress there is now a bipartisan consensus, certainly on the China Commission, that sees China really for what it is, and especially on on human rights and the criticism of China's human rights records from both sides of the aisle. I think is is uh, is very positive, and. Again, I think with businesses, you know, we have to call out the the hypocrisy on on you know the, the lip service that they pay pay to ESG, you know, environment, social, and governance uh, standards, because um, if it's to mean anything, uh, you know, that you you should not be having uh, forced labor, slave labor in your supply chains. Um, you know, there should be, I think, greater emphasis on on that and that's something that i think congress has successfully done uh especially with the Uyghur forced labor prevention act which was a product of what we call the four corners of the uh, of the china commission the the um uh then chairman and uh, co-chairman and the senate and house side joined by the ranking members and it's the same different configuration but the same four members um, uh, Jim McGovern, Chris Smith on the House side, uh, Marco Rubio and Senator Merkley on the on, on the Senate side um, that passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And that's been a game changer because it shifts the burden of proof onto U.S. importers uh, to demonstrate that there's no uh, forced labor in their supply chain. 
And while implementation hasn't been perfect, uh, we are certainly in a much better place than where we were uh, before uh, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act was was passed. And that, I think, uh, you know, Department of Homeland Security, and I, I think there's a lot of uh, good there. Uh, Secretary uh, Silvers, Under Secretary Silvers uh, at uh, Department of Homeland Security, who's testified before our commission, I think is is very sincere in his team. Uh, more can be done. More can be done to identify Chinese companies that use forced labor and putting them on a, on an entity list, um, which is one of the things that this, the uh, the statute calls for. Um, but I think we are making progress. So I, again, overall, I think there is a uh, a overall positive trajectory here, and um, you know I think we it's important for Congress to keep that pressure on so that it does continue. Well, when it comes to pressure from Wall Street. I mean, are we seeing Wall Street lobbyists go into congressional offices and say, hey, don't sign this uh, Uyghur Act or this Hong Kong Act? Yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. At the, at the time, uh, I think you saw Apple, you saw various uh, uh, businesses weighing in. The And, and if you, uh, Josh Rogan in the Washington Post, I think, covered some of that. It was uh, an administration at the time was uh, pressuring, this was the last Congress, uh, I think was pressuring the congressional leadership not to to pass the bill. It was actually, I think, Senator Merkley who brought, broke the dam there. Um, he uh, uh, revealed that pressure and that created, I think, uh, a um, uh, Congress um, did uh, move forward with the bill, passed it, and the, that pressure, I think, overcame the Wall Street lobbying, and the president did sign it into law. So we now have that tool in our toolkit. Um, but uh, so I think that's a case where uh, the Wall Street pressure was was overcome. For the typical congressperson uh, in a competitive district, uh, I imagine that there's a lot of uh, campaign funding that they need to rely on that comes from Wall Street directly and indirectly. And, you know, I think Congress people are essentially always running for the next term because it's such a short term, two years, right? So uh, how much how much of the campaign money for a typical congressperson is coming from Wall Street sources? And, and how, how do they uh, overcome that? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, to win elections, you got to win the votes. And the... Where the American people now, I think, are, you know, vis-a-vis the Chinese Communist Party, the American people are realists. I think the the um, uh, what happened over the summer with the the what's called the spy balloon, I think, opened a lot of people's eyes. And in the fallout to that, I'd mentioned uh, um, Deputy Secretary Wendy Sherman. Uh, part of the fallout was that was that she's no longer, um, uh, you know, the number two person at the State Department. Um, I think when it was revealed that um, she was not in in favor of a uh, uh, a yeah vigorous response there, so even the administration in in that respect uh, responded to I think where the American people are, and um, I think that you know the it's been people like uh, like Chris Smith and and Frank Wolf who's no, no longer in Congress, who are the, the China realists. And again, you know, I, you, you got to give credit where it's due. Um, Nancy Pelosi on the Democratic side has been a, a, uh, uh, a strong voice on, on, on China. And I think what uh, distinguishes people like that uh, is that uh, they do listen. Uh, you know, Chris Smith, um, who appointed me to the commission, uh, he would always meet with dissidents. He would always get a um, an insider perspective from um, uh, not what the corporate lobbyists or the inside the beltway opinion was trying to, the narrative they were trying to shape about, about China, but actually listening to the voices of, of uh, Chinese who, are, who are, have been persecuted um, politically. And my understanding is that uh, former Speaker Pelosi did that as, as well. And it's listening to those voices that give um, uh, congressional uh, figures a, a realistic understanding of what the situation is in, in, in Congress. So um, I think overall, um, the um, 
yeah, that 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 um, that change that 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 has taken place since say 2016 has has been uh, one that's um, uh, very effective. Um, th- there is a member of the commission who used to be represent a major U.S. corporation in in China. His position over time has has changed vis-a-vis China. So I think um, uh, it. it yeah, overall, I think we're we're uh, we're in a much better place. Well, that is very encouraging to hear that that can happen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think I've heard about the Congressional Executive Commission over the years because you hold a lot of hearings about China issues. But could you explain a little bit about what it is exactly that the commission does overall? I think a lot of people, uh, you know, our, our viewers that probably um, don't really know much about how some of these like inner workings, how these like commissions work and how they relate to things like passing the Uyghur Forced Labor Act? Sure. I'm happy to answer that question. Well, what's what's really interesting is that the commission grew out of those debates uh, back in the 1990s over uh, trade relations with China. Um, You know, the the, um, formerly China's most favored nation status was put up to a vote each uh, each Congress each year, uh, actually, and they had to demonstrate that they were making uh, progress on human rights. That changed uh, during the Clinton administration uh, when uh, China was granted permanent normal trade relations status, and that was sort of the you know really the ascendancy of the engagement. Uh, theory there, that if you engage China and China's leaders, it will, uh, um, they'll become part of the global economy. Um, the nature of the government will change and ultimately it would matriculate into something resembling a democracy it would evolve towards rule of law. Um, and, uh, and then the specific impetus for the creation of the commission was when China entered the uh, World Trade Organization. In some ways, it was a bone that was thrown to the China realists by 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 Congress. Uh, um, th- th- those that said that no, we, we really do need to hold China accountable on its human rights record, and the commission was was formed uh, to produce an annual report, or this is part of the statutory mandate, an annual report that assesses China's human rights uh, record to maintain a, a create maintain a political prisoner database of, of Chinese political prisoners, and then hold hearings to inform Congress. I think in those earlier days, the a lot of the commissioners were um, uh, pro-engagement. They thought that the engagement uh, theory would hold sway. Chris Smith, the current chairman, was never in that camp. He was uh, always, I think, you know, James Mann had the term the China fantasy. Um, uh, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, was the China realists who understood that this idea of engaging a communist regime that never changed its 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 principles um, would always, um, uh, you know, would not lead to... Uh, uh, to engagement. Instead of them becoming more like us, we would become more like them. And in, in some ways, I think that has, uh, uh, that has happened, especially uh, vis-a-vis U.S. businesses uh, in particular and um, the ignoring of these human rights concerns. So anyway, the commission was established uh, around the year 2000. It's been uh, in existence ever since. And uh, yeah, we continue to, to shine a light on China's uh, human rights record uh, there. But, you know, thank you for the question. I got to say, I I definitely prefer hearing the term China realist versus the China hawks, which is what a lot of China doves use. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's it's a realistic appraisal. I think uh, it's, if you try to understand China, you know, and I I think it's, we could go, if you want to go a little deeper, you know, you've got two strands of Chinese political thought that have been very influential. Uh, one is Chinese legalism, uh, which in many ways is a proto-totalitarian theory. The first dynasty to unify China was a uh, was based on legalist principles. People talk about Xi Jinping, and he's uh, some of the optimists said that oh, he stands for rule of law. No, he stands for rule by law, using the law. Uh, to suppress, to advance Communist Party objectives. So you have this tradition of Chinese legalism onto which Marxist-Leninism and Maoism has been uh, glommed onto. 
The contrary tradition would be Confucianism. And, and while Confucianism oftentimes there was an attempt to co-opt it by the by by the state. If you look at Confucianism in its in its essence, it poses a challenge to illegitimate regimes. Um, you know, there's a, a passage in in Mencius, the second great Confucian uh, philosopher, where he talks about the idea of the mandate of heaven. That's something that people probably have heard a lot about. And you know, he's asked the question: Is it ever legitimate to overthrow a government and even to to uh, kill a king, regicide? And he says no, um, but you know the government that's legitimate. No, the, you can't overthrow it, but you can overthrow a tyranny. And a tyrant is someone uh, who does not rule in accordance with the Tao, the, the the law above the law. It's akin to our natural law concepts here. And, and actually, there's a very similar passage in Aquinas, Saint Thomas Aquinas, where he's asked the same question. Um, but um, uh, and, and Mencius has this phrase, and it's an even older phrase that he quotes. He says that heaven sees with the eyes of the people and hears with the ears of the people. This is a proto-democratic theory uh, there. And I think one of the reasons why Xi Jinping tries to co-opt the, the, the mantle of Confucius, you know, for example, the Confucius Institutes, there's a, a, a Chinese uh, television program with Marx and Confucius. The Economist just wrote about it the, uh, the other day. Uh, that's an attempt to sort of, uh, I think, whistle past the graveyard. Uh, Li Keqiang, the the somewhat reformist uh, communist leader who passed away somewhat unexpectedly, and and people thought he was relatively young. It was very interesting. He had made a speech, uh, just I think the last speech that he had he had made, where he does reference heaven has eyes, which was a, an allusion, uh, I think, to that older passage there that, that from, from Mencius that where he says, heaven sees the eyes of the people and hears of the ears of the people. So there's a real sort of question of, of, of Chinese, uh, of, of legitimacy of, of the regime, which I think the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping fears, and it comes from within the Chinese tradition as well. Um, so the, the, the line that Xi Jinping, like Li Kuan Yu did, that Human rights is in democracy are contrary to Asian values. That's not uh, that's not true, and, and in fact, if you look at the two Chinese polities, if you look at uh, at, at the People's Republic of China, but then you look at uh, Taiwan, the Republic of China, um, in many ways, uh, they, the, Taiwan shows an evolution of this more benign Confucian uh, theory. And we can go into the weeds on that and why that is. Um, but you know, one that's I think consonant with with democracy, yet still a thoroughly uh, Chinese polity. And whereas the uh, on the mainland, you've seen this legalist strain that has uh, has dominated, onto which Marxism Leninism is is infused to uh, create a governing ideology. But but and, and one of the reasons I think the animus directed towards Taiwan. As a practical matter, as long as Taiwan exists, uh, it gives lie to the claims that uh, that China cannot, uh, you know, that the Chinese people don't want democracy. They they do, um, and again, that goes to the point that it's very important that that um, U.S. companies do not subsidize tyranny. It's also important that administration policy. If you look, for example, the administration of George H. W. Bush after Tiananmen. He sent Brent Scowcroft to Beijing and, and said that, hey, don't worry about it. We're, we're, we'll get back on track. That was the wrong uh, message to, to, to send. And hopefully that's not the result of, of, of APEC either, where, again, when you have a regime that, that, you know, and you look at the people that were in the street, the white paper protests, they, a very large gathering that has gone unnoticed in Tibet uh, that took place uh, last September where you had over a million people uh, gathered there for a religious and cultural gathering. There's a lot of ferment in China. And, uh, you know, heaven does see with the eyes of the people and hear with the ears of the people. And that's something I think that the regime um, fears. U.S. and U.S. corporations should side with the Chinese people, not with this uh, brutal regime. I, I really love that analysis because I, I all the time hear from people who have never read the Analects of Confucius or never read anything from Mencius say, oh, yeah, it's, it's China's not communist. It's 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 Confucian thing. Or Confucianism is authoritarian. Somehow that the Confucian tradition is 
responsible for yeah the like, communism just evolved out right. of or not, right. not even communists evolved out of it but like they just ignore the communist stuff it, until haven't you yeah, found that yeah. like they don't even it's like marxist leninist what is that and they're just like oh well china's confucian and that's why they're so obedient to the government blah 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 uh. yeah well, well, Confucianism is – there is parts about being, you know, respectful and obedient to the authority. But the caveat is, you know, as as you mentioned, Piero, like the caveat is that the, the rulers have to have the mandate of heaven. And if they right. are are um, jerks, then they lose that. Exactly. And I think Confucianism understands there, there's rights and there's duties and they, they, are, they interact with each other. Um, and it is, and at the base of it, the basis of human relations, you know, while the emperor subject in traditional Confucian thought was an important relationship, at its core, it's the family, um, the, the uh, parents and the children, uh, husband and wife, uh, siblings. And, you know, if you look at, 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 at communism, especially the, you know, the, the horrors of the Cultural Revolution, it's antithetical to that notion, the idea that, that no one exists uh, outside the state. Everyone has to do that, which is, I, I think, uh, very much core of Xi Jinping's thought, just as it was with Mao, Mao Zedong's thought and, and uh, communist tyrants. You know, if you look at the, the Soviet Union, Stalin, Lenin, um, Marx and Engels. Engels, you know, we focus on Marx uh, a lot because he was the, uh, I guess, the smarter of the duo. But Engels wrote a tract that uh, attacked the family. And and if you understand that how the communist project really wants to replace the family with the, with the state, um, you, it, it, you know, Confucianism is is a an antidote to that. And even despite the uh, you know, the horrors of the uh, you know the Cultural Revolution, um, yeah, the family unit does still uh, remain intact in in in, in China. But uh, but yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, Confucianism is is misunderstood, and a, an authentic uh, understanding of Confucianism, one that's not co opted by the state, um, I think, can be the basis for uh, a reform movement uh, in China as well. A Confucian style democracy. Interesting. There's a there's a book or journal article to write about that for someone. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Not, uh, not us, but someone. 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 Um, well, yeah. here I'm, Chinese I, democracy is not just uh, an album by Guns N' Roses. It's. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the, it came too the, late. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was I was wondering here. You had been in Taiwan during the eighties, right? Yeah. Um, you'd lived there kind of during their transition from an authoritarian state essentially under the KMT to this like democracy you know looking back do you have what was your experience like there and and what do you think about um how Taiwan has evolved today and what lessons China could learn from that sure sure well Taiwan I was there and I went there first in 1988 which was a year after martial law was lifted um you could still see a you know military presence around bridges and other sensitive uh areas I remember you had these sort of uh, uh, big character posters, you know, uh, fight communism will prevail uh, outside the presidential building in Taipei, uh, recapture the mainland. Uh, so in many ways, there was still a lot of the, um, uh, I guess, hangover from the martial law uh, period. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I think certainly the, a, a realistic appraisal or a, an objective appraisal of Taiwan during that martial law period has to take into account the white terror um, and uh, that people were, it was an authoritarian regime. On the other hand, you did have things such as you had freedom of religion, you had basically a free economy. And one thing that is important to keep in mind, you know, when you evaluate people like uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingguo, his his uh, his son, um, they did keep Taiwan free from communism, which allowed the democracy to eventually uh, evolve to the vibrant democracy that it, that it is today. Uh, in some ways, and if you look at the the Constitution of the Republic of China. Um, which I think it was the 1947 constitution, which uh, had certain Confucian elements. You know, so for example, Taiwan, unlike our three branches of government, they have five branches: the 
executive, legislative, and, and judicial like we have, but they also have what's called a control yen and a, um, an examination yen. And that was supposed to replicate the role of the Confucian bureaucracy that um, served as sort of an ombudsman, that was the control yen function, but also held examinations to select uh, a, a meritocratic uh, bureaucracy, uh, bureaucratic class, so that people would be governed by people that um, that were bureaucratic, and it served as a check on the emperor's power traditionally. So that 1947, I think it was 1947, uh, constitution was kind of after the uh, communist uh, took over the mainland and Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists retreated to Taiwan. It was kind of frozen in time. And it was only after martial law was lifted and you began to see true democratic elections and, and uh, reforms under the Constitution that that promise of, uh, of democracy and constitutional government, republicanism, uh, it, it came to, uh, uh, really came into, into fruition. And again, that's an example uh, for, um, for the mainland. As long as you have Taiwan and you show that a Chinese people can be um, you know, uh, self-governing and elect their own, their own leaders, that's a challenge to the Chinese Communist Party. That's a challenge to, uh, uh, to Xi Jinping and uh, you know, all the other members of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, that, that, uh, and especially that core elite there of the 100 families or, or, or so. Um, that comprise the leadership of the uh, of the, the CCP. Plus, Taiwan's democracy gave us bubble tea pizza. That's something that <laughs> Islamism in China never gave us. Uh, so, so I'm I'm very curious about um, how like how the China Commission gets things done in particular, because I know you talk a lot about human rights in China, yeah. which in some ways is something you can't really influence tremendously. And then you also have uh, on the U.S. side, you have to deal with Wall Street and how, how do you rein them in? So, you know, while the China Commission is a commission and it's comprised of members of the Senate, members of the House, and also members of the administration, we have three commissioners from the State Department, one from the Department of Labor and one from the Department of Commerce. Even though we don't have uh, the... Um, uh, authority to mark up legislation. One advantage that we do have is that the commissioners and ranking members are uh, comprised of members of the House from both parties and members of the Senate from both parties. Given that, and you know, go back to your schoolhouse rock, how do you get a bill uh, passed and signed into law? You need both houses of Congress. The fact that we have uh, members from both uh, sides, uh, uh, both um, sides of the aisle, but also both chambers gives us an advantage so that when the uh, I mentioned the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, um, because of that collaboration it already exists because of our structure between House and Senate, um, that bill was passed into law. We actually have another bill now, uh, the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices Act that's going to be marked up uh, before the Foreign Affairs Committee next week. That again is a Four Corners uh, product. It's Mr. Smith. Uh, in the uh, uh, Congressman Smith in, in the House, joined by Congressman Jim McGovern, the chairman and ranking member on the House side. On the Senate side, uh, it is Senator uh, Rubio and Senator Merkley's uh, bill. Um, the House bill is going to be the, the, the one that, that advances. Um, it, it is, uh, I, I'm fairly confident, let me just tell you what the bill does. Uh, Hong Kong has three economic and trade offices. They're not embassies because it's it's not a, a, a sovereign nation. But back when we thought that Hong Kong would be autonomous, it'd be, have its own system in place for 50 years, as was promised uh, during the, 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 the handover, Hong Kong was allowed these economic and trade offices. As democracy has been squelched in, in Hong Kong, and it's become apparent that Hong Kong no longer has that uh, promised uh, freedom of, of movement or, or autonomy, and the government's become uh, repressive uh, there. It's clear that that Hong Kong, these Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices are just adjuncts, really, of the, their outposts of the PRC. And they've been implicated in the harassment of, uh, of dissidents, of Hong Kong dissidents here in the United States. 
Um, just digress for a second. At APEC, this is something also that we're taking a close look at. There were protesters, pro-democracy protesters from Hong Kong, from Tibet, Uyghurs that were harassed, also Chinese mainland dissidents, and, and uh, they were beaten up by these pro-China uh, counter-demonstrators, so almost Antifa-like uh, people. The San Francisco police stood by and did nothing. In fact, there was one, the one person who was arrested was a pro-democracy uh, dissident who was himself beaten up. Um, so that's something I think that we really need to 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 to, to look at the the harassment of people. But well, so that was that the Hong Kong like office that facilitated this? Uh, no, I don't want to uh, uh, say that. There have been other incidents where Hong Kong uh, dissidents, such as Anna Kwok, uh, have been harassed. If you, we did a hearing last May, which looks at uh, at um, uh, at Hong Kong and the erosion of rule of law in Hong Kong. And uh, I think if you read the testimony there of, of uh, um, Hong Kong dissidents who, who testified, you'll, uh, you can read about the role that uh, these economic and trade offices have played in harassment. Now, there have been allegations that some of these counter protesters that beat up the pro democracy uh, protesters were, um, there was some coordination with the uh, you know, Chinese consulate there. I don't think we can necessarily go that far yet, but it's something I think that needs uh, that Congress needs to look at and uh, the administration as well. Um, this idea of, of transnational repression, you know, the, you read about the Chinese police stations. In fact, uh, I think it was in, in uh, July, uh, we had a, a hearing on transnational repression. Um, that's something that's that's very very real. Uh, dissidents are harassed. Um, there is there are credible allegations. They're probably the most important Chinese dissident here in the U.S. Wei Jingsheng. That there've been at least two attempts on his life. Uh, there was an incident last in May of 2022 uh, where he was driving outside of Washington D.C. and a car came. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and cut him off, and another car came over from behind and tried to push him off the uh, off the road. Um, I think Newsweek reported that as well. So we have activities by uh, uh, Chinese agents uh, here in in the U.S. Even uh, that really needs to bear closer scrutiny. If you talk to Uyghur human rights activists, they'll say that they're um, they're harassed. Often, the, the intimidation, however occurs because they have relatives in China and, you know, they get these messages that unless you um, tone down your activism, for example, um, you yeah, know, things will happen to your, uh, to your relatives. Um, uh, and, you know, there, there's, there, there are, uh, and, and again, I don't want to go too far out there, but these are, are allegations and they deserve closer, closer scrutiny. So the, the Hong Kong trade and economic offices, this bill, um, that's being worked on in Congress. Um, what is the what is the bill relation? So, so, to so basically, it would authorize the president to shut down these um, uh, these outposts, really, of the PRC, uh, because the what had been hoped for at the time that Hong Kong would retain a degree of autonomy, uh, and again could be a a pull factor away from the center. Uh, what we've seen with what's happened just in the past five years, democracy has been squelched in 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 uh, in, in Hong Kong. Um, you have uh, o over a thousand people who have been arrested in Hong Kong, mostly young people, seventy percent young people, for demonstrating for, and for democracy activism. That's an incarceration rate that's sort of on par with countries like Burma, Belarus, um, Iran, probably. Uh, as as well, um, you've seen the judiciary, which uh, has it still has the pomp and ceremony. It still has the uh, the wigs and the uh, the robes of the that they inherited from the British. But but basically, it's rubber stamping these convictions based on this national security law that was uh, imposed at the you know at the directives of Beijing uh, in 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 Hong Kong. Uh, you're seeing uh, freedom of religion also uh, undermined there in in Hong Kong. Uh, control of the school curriculum, including 
uh, Catholic schools uh, too, which in Hong Kong traditionally played an outside role uh, there. In fact, if it's what's interesting, sort of as a side note, a lot of the debates in Hong Kong between the pro-government and the pro-democracy people are debate, debates among Catholics on, on both sides. Um, are obviously, Cardinal Zen, who's been the spiritual head of, of uh, sort of the uh, principled re- resistance to these government dictates. Jimmy Lai, who's in, in prison, a, a, a uh, Catholic, uh, Martin Lee, um, uh, a- Anson a- Chan, you've, you've uh, on, on, on the other side, you know, John Lee, the, pres- the, 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 the current uh, head of the Hong Kong government, who was banned from coming to APEC, uh, also uh, Catholic. So in some ways, it's, it's interesting, and that's uh, in part, the role that Catholic schools played in, in Hong Kong, but now you see the, uh, you know, according to Cardinal Zen, who first noticed it, I think back in 2012, there was this encroachment upon the uh, upon the curriculum there. So we're really seeing a multi-layered uh, attack on all avenues of of, uh, of independent thought in in Hong Kong, and that's something that should be very much uh, of of concern. So essentially, then, uh, this bill would give the president the authority to say, okay, like, we're not going to, like, we're just going to shut down all of these, like, quasi embassies under the guise of Hong Kong. And then the only embassy uh, that represents the People's Republic of China would be the official one. Right. Yeah. So there there are three... Uh, economic and trade offices, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., DC and New York, and they would be, uh, uh, the president would have the authority to shut it down. And, and, and that, I think, underscores an important point. You know, Hong Kong says it's, well, we're open for business. It's back to normal. It's not back to normal. And U.S. businesses have to understand that. U.S. businesses that either do business in, in Hong Kong or, or China, mainland China. The other thing that's important you know, we have to close loopholes with Hong Kong. Hong Kong does not have, so the, the export restrictions that we have on dual use technology to mainland China uh, don't exist for, for Hong Kong. So that's another loophole. It's not addressed with this bill, but that's another uh, loophole that needs to be uh, uh, addressed as, as, as well. But Wait, so, important- so U.S. companies can export sensitive technology that has military use to Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. and as it, if like somehow mainland China does not control Hong Kong. So, so that, and, and I think there's also um, you, you have to look at companies like Nvidia um, too, and uh, their their role in continuing to supply China. Defense companies like Raytheon they supply us, and they also supply the the the, the Chinese. So I think we really need to take a, American businesses to the extent that they still see themselves as American and not globalist entities, really need to take a, a long, hard look at where they stand. And that is something that, you know, individual CEOs need to kind of look at themselves in, in, in the mirror. We've been very critical of, of uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific. That's a, a, um, a company that uh, um, has these DNA markers that have been implicated in the um, uh, in collecting DNA um, without consent from Tibetans and ethnic Uyghurs, um, it's been used by the you know the police to to track something. China is very intent on obtaining DNA information. There have been allegations, and again, these are allegations um, that we're going to look at more closely. That um, these DNA markers have been used to identify um, organ donors, unwilling organ donors. Uh, uh, for forced organ harvesting. When I was at the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission and, and uh, Chris Smith was the chairman, we held a hearing on uh, China's uh, uh, organ harvesting. Um, uh, um, uh, well, it's, it's, it's the horrors of China's organ harvesting. Um, the We had credible testimony from people like Ethan Gutman um, that uh, China basically takes, and the ideal age is 28 years old, they take oftentimes Uyghurs and others that that um, fit a certain DNA profile, 
and that, that they uh, then are, are basically on order. So you, the, their organs are, are harvested uh, from them. There was a, an important journal uh, article in the American Journal of, of uh, Transplantation, which looked at Chinese literature. And they said that the number of legitimate organs under the dead donor rule in China and the number of transplants, there's a delta here, um, that the, the number of actual uh, organ transplants that take uh, place in, in, um, in China, uh, they, they have to be getting don- organs illicitly. Uh, when we was in Taiwan a few months ago, we met with, I'd mentioned the control yen, which serves as that oversight uh, mechanism, one of the five branches of government. We had a meeting with the control yen. Um, they've uncovered evidence that you have, Taiwan has banned organ tourism. You can't go to mainland China to, for the purposes of getting uh, an organ illicitly. Um, but what they found was that people would be returning to, to Taiwan and they would be filing insurance claims for immunosuppressants, even though ostensibly they went there for just you know, two weeks of, of, of tourism. So that's something that Taiwan is looking at in their own country. You know, kudos to them for trying to keep their own house in order, um, you know, that, that you have uh, uh, people from Taiwan. But this, this, it's, it's not just Taiwan. There's this, um, you know, organ tourism. Uh, is is a phenomenon. Uh, if you talk to Uyghur activists, they'll say one of the reasons that the Uyghur are harvested now it used to be the Falun Gong. The Falun Gong were often the um, the targets of, of Chinese organ harvesting. It seems to have shifted now towards uh, Uyghurs and other uh, predominantly Muslim Central Asians uh, there. It's because their organs are considered halal. Uh, they haven't eaten pork or, or drunk alcohol. So there is a uh, marketing of halal organs uh, in countries in the Persian Gulf. And again, that's something I think that deserves closer scrutiny. Um, um, you know, there are videos that uh, show Chinese hospital uh, catering to, uh, um, you know, Muslims from the, uh, the Persian Gulf in, in particular, the Gulf countries. If you talk to Uyghurs, they will say that this is, you know, this is a great, betrayal um, that uh, um, you know, that they're being harvested to provide uh, organs for uh, uh, for others um, uh, again that's something that I think deserves closer scrutiny um, perhaps it's the subject of another hearing uh, Ethan Gutman who's done some great work he wrote a book called the slaughter which I would highly recommend um, is coming out with more um, evidence on on organ harvesting. Um, there's even a, a Taiwan presidential uh, election angle in this whole sordid story, too, if uh, people are interested. Um, uh, Ke Wenzhen, uh, the former mayor of Taipei, um, it's been alleged that uh, you know he did represent Medtronics, which is, again, an American company that had these ECMO machines uh, that were used in the uh, an organ transplantation and transportation of, of organs. He was the uh, uh, representative of Medtronics uh, there as a medical doctor. And um, it has been alleged that he, he did teach uh, certain transplantation techniques that were then used in, in, in mainland China. Um, that is something that uh, I don't, I don't want to go beyond the, uh, the evidence, but that certainly is something that's been, uh, uh, debated Ethan Gutman, um, whom I re- referred to, uh, uh, did get caught up in, in some debates over that. And uh, um, I think he's been uh, vindicated um, uh, uh, in, in that regard. Right. But Cohen is not just any guy, like he's a major presidential candidate. Yeah. Yeah. And if um, you want to talk Taiwan. So Taiwan's going to have a, a, an election in, in January. The currently leading in the polls is the Democratic Progressive Party uh, um, nominee. The Democratic Progressive Party, which was this opposition party that had been suppressed during the the um, period of authoritarian uh, rule, but it, it emerged um, as a democratic alternative as Taiwan liberalized. The current president's a member of the Democratic Progressive Party. Um, she's term limited. So the, uh, William Lai is the, um, 
nominee for the for the Demo- the the DPP. He just nominated as his running mate uh, B Kim Shao or or uh, Mei Chin Shao. Uh, she is Taiwan's representative here in the United States. She's someone who knows America, who understands America. Um, it, I think that was a good choice on on his part. The traditional Guomindang candidate is Ho Yo Yi. Uh, the former mayor of New pa- Taipei City, and also the former police commissioner, someone who's personally very brave uh, too. I've I've met him, and he's he's compelling also in his his own way. He's not getting much traction in the polls, but one thing about Ho Yo Yi, which is interesting about his character, um, a number of decades ago when he was police chief, there was a serial killer in Taiwan who killed the daughter of a famous actress, and who had taken the South African military attaché and his family hostage uh, there, and it was feared that he was going to kill them. Um, there were, I think, some delivery people who noticed something was awry, you know, called the police, and Ho Yo himself went in unarmed and, um, you know, basically, uh, uh, yeah, res- resolved the uh, the situation, captured the, uh, the serial killer. Um, those are the two main party candidates, and then there's uh, uh, Mayor Ko, uh, Ko Wenjen, and he is with this third party. There were talks just this past week that Ho Yo Yi, who's lagging in the polls, and, and Mayor Ko would join forces. And I think as of this morning, those talks have broken down. Um, some somewhat curious behavior by by uh, uh, Ko and Jen, Mayor, Mayor Ko, um, in, in that regard. Um, but... Uh, uh, so it's unclear as if there's going to be a, a merged unity um, uh, uh, um, ticket there. So right now with the three main contenders there, and there's also another one, Terry Guo, who lost the KMT nomination to uh, Ho Yo Yi, um, who's uh, another fourth party candidate. He's the Foxconn guy. He's the fellow who has, I think, that's the largest plant in um uh, in China, uh, Foxconn is a, a Apple supplier, and that's an interesting question of what leverage China would have over him. So you have, as of now, four presidential candidates. The DPP candidate from the governing party is right now in the lead, and probably if there was no uh, unity um, ticket there, uh, the DPP, if the election were held today, would would win. Well, since we're on the topic of Taiwan, I'm curious, you know, Congress has generally supported the defense of Ukraine and Israel. Do you think if the People's Liberation Army invades Taiwan, will Congress also back Taiwan? Are we spread too thin? Yeah. Okay. So that's, I I think, obviously, we want to deter an invasion. And and that's the, the objective here. And to do that, you know, Taiwan needs to be supplied with, with, uh, uh, the necessary um, military equipment to to defend itself. Uh, I will say this: that ultimately, you know, ta- Taiwan's defense depends on the the, the Taiwanese people. I, I think that um, one thing that's very troubling, um, you know, last year the Taiwan's military uh, academy it's supposed to take in a class I think of a thousand people. Uh, it only um, I think there were less than three hundred that um, were accepted there. They had to bring in non-commissioned officers to supplement that somewhat. So I think the class came to you know, roughly 800 plus there. But in terms of a indicator of Taiwan's willingness to defend itself, I think that was something that was very disturbing. Um, I think also on the China angle too, um, there are questions about whether the willingness of China to sustain casualties. And, and what I mean by this is you know, l- the last time China went to war seriously was 1979 in Vietnam. And it sustained a lot of casualties in a roughly three, four week uh, engagement. I think the official toll was something like 8,000 dead, probably much, much higher. It probably was comparable to um you know, what we saw the Russians suffering in the opening of the Ukraine invasion as well. And that's a land invasion, not a maritime uh, invasion. 
One thing that was very interesting about 1979, much of the fighting that was done was done by soldiers from rural areas. Soldiers from urban areas, and, and I know this because I was a student at Columbia at the time, and there was a, 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 a Chinese woman whose father was, I think, PLA, a People's Liberation Army, and said that the soldiers from urban areas, Shanghai in particular, um, failed uh, really, and, and would flee the battlefield. In fact, he had commissars, just like at Stalingrad, shooting, you know, kind of fleeing PLA soldiers there. Um, and uh, um, so there was a, a discrepancy even then among sort of these uh, urbanized uh, Chinese soldiers. But what other important policy uh, uh, thing happened in 1979? The one-child policy. If you fast forward to today, in, in a sense, every PLA soldier is a, uh, a, Shang, you know, a Shanghainese soldier, a, a, a single child. I think it's something like close to 80% of PLA soldiers have no, no siblings. If you had an invasion and you had casualties uh, like you saw in Vietnam or like you saw in, in, in Ukraine, you're cutting off whole family lines then. And I think it's an open question about whether the Chinese people, um, despite whatever initial jingoism, you know, if they really have the will to sustain a uh, an in invasion of Taiwan because of, of of that. And if if you want to talk about policy blunders, I mean, yes, China is, like I said, a systemic rival, not just a strategic rival. They they, they seek to recapture or, or take over global institutions and reconstitute things in their own own own, own image. Um, but you know they're not uh, in invincible by any means, and there are a lot of contradictions there that China has to has to cope with. One of which is this demographic collapse that's attributable to the one China policy, and the second one is this enormous amount of debt that they've run up both uh, abroad and at home. And I think we have to look at what happens over the course of the next uh, years, if not months, uh, to China's economy. But it, again, goes to the point that we made earlier, U.S. businesses should not be subsidizing tyranny. And if we let things kind of take their natural course, if the Chinese people who were out in the streets um, uh, back um, uh, last year and after the COVID restrictions were, were, were lifted, um, you know, the Chinese, I think, you know, in many ways, democracy will uh, prevail. Again, heaven sees the eyes of the people and hears of the ears of the people. Um, it, it um, you know, so at the same time, while Xi Jinping consolidated power, apparently, at the 20th Party Congress last October, um, we're also seeing, in addition to these centripetal forces, these centrifugal forces, and, and maybe we could close on this, you know, one of the most important works of Chinese literature is the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And the opening line there basically says that the, the realm uh, long divided must unite, long united must divide. And that, I think, is very much a metaphor to what we see in, in China today. On the one hand, we see the Chinese Communist Party trying to centralize its power and uh, uh, there, and then you, at the same time, you see these kind of uh, people pulling away from that, and you do see a, a, a tension there, and how that's resolved, um, I think, ultimately depends on, on the Chinese people. But for our part, the U.S. should not be, be subsidizing tyranny. Neither our government should be bailing that out or U.S. corporations. I think a lot of people may not realize that, like the briefings, the hearings uh, that you uh, conduct are publicly available. Like you can go watch a hearing that uh, your um, the com commission has conducted, correct? Yeah, if you go to cecc.gov, you will see all of our uh, hearings there. You can click on the links and you can uh, watch the, the, the hearings. Um, uh, we just held a hearing last week on China's control of the cobalt supply chains from the Dominican Republic. Uh, the month before, we had one on uh, uh, China's using forced labor in the deep sea fishing and also fish processing, uh, fish that 
uh, enters the U.S. supply chain. In fact, our, our Department of Defense uh, buys uh, fish from China that uh, has uh, uh, that forced labor uh, helped catch and then process. So do uh, U.S. schools. Um, uh, so this is something where I think we really need to not just American businesses have to cleanse their supply chains and know where, where uh, what their supply chains are, but also um, the U.S. government does as well. I definitely recommend anyone watching check out some of those briefings. Thank you again for joining us. This was very insightful. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. Mm-mm. No, I was going to say, as soon as uh, Piero said something about Romance of the Three Kingdoms, I was like, this is now your favorite podcast. Not just that, not just that, but the Confucian-style democracy stuff. I love all of that stuff. Restore Confucius's name. I love that. Maybe we should should put that on a Confucius Institute. That's it. (laughs) You're fired, Matt. I think the t-shirt was a better idea. I think so. Um, Yeah, we can make that merch. Um, Also, I just want to point out that, you know, you can make brilliant observations about romance of the three kingdoms nobody's doing that with uh, dreams of red chamber sorry that book sucks i mean are there life lessons from dream of the red chamber yes like like name one probably don't marry your cousin oh okay fair (laughs) (laughs) it's not even the cousin he wanted to marry it was the other cousin kissing cousins uh, you know, there's lots of other things, but I think this is a G-rated podcast, so maybe we should not go into those. And that could be. And that book is like an R-rated book, if you if you can understand the innuendo of Red there Chamber. Was a, there was another, before Red Chambers, there was another book that was kind of a contender for the fourth Chinese classic that was pretty much just pure erotica. Are you talking about the peach vase? Plum, Plum in vase. the flower oh, vase God, or something. I don't remember. Okay, obviously. Yeah. Which was interesting because it takes a little story from another one of the four Chinese classics, um, Water Margin or Outlaws of the March. It takes that a story from that and then makes a whole book out of so it. So like it's like an erotic fan fiction. It basically is. It's, it's the Fifty world. Shades of Grey. Yeah, China <laughs> gave us the first erotic fan fiction. Everything came from China. I feel like you're doing the opposite of what you wanted to do, which was boost romance of the three kingdoms. And now Mm -hmm. people are going to be looking up the plum vase thing. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I I no longer want to share this podcast with uh, (laughs) Piero. I I, I just am now imagining you trying to read romance of the three kingdoms, but instead you accidentally read a knockoff version. Oh, what is this? Why are they in Hogwarts? (laughs) <laughs> mm. but actually romance of the three kingdoms makes me think we should play that game again dynasty warriors yes yeah once we get our streaming setup figured out this whole co- podcast was like serious topics you know interesting discussions about mm-hmm. you know historical chinese prescient philosophy. observations about taiwanese bubble tea pizza yeah and we've just completely sunk it at the uh, end uh does anyone watch the endings let us know in the comments below if you're watching this. <laughs> Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelly John. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Let's have a Taiwanese bubble tea pizza for lunch. See you next time.